Welcome. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces out there, but that won't prevent me from introducing myself again. I'm Keith Bybee, and I direct the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics and the Media. And uh, every spring, we uh, put together a lecture series on law, politics, and the media, where we bring out a variety of distinguished practitioners uh, to address issues under this, this broad rubric of law, politics, and the media. This is a lecture series that's co-sponsored by the Tully Center for Free Speech, uh, directed by that man right there, Roy Gutterman, the fellow who makes my elevator rise. <laughs> That's right. Um, and uh, we uh, have typically eight speakers for this uh, series. And uh, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our speaker for today, who also happens to be our, our eighth and final speaker uh, for this semester. Our speaker is Marguerite Sullivan, who is the Senior Director for the Center uh, for International Media Assistance. Uh, Marguerite Sullivan started this think tank, uh, which is uh, located in the National Endowment uh, for Democracy about five years ago. I think the fifth anniversary is just coming up. And uh, the Center for International Media Assistance, or, or CIMA, it studies the indispensable role of independent media uh, in the creation and development of sustainable, sustainable democracies uh, around the world. Uh, before becoming a director of CIMA, uh, Marguerite was a journalist. She worked for newspapers in Boston and in California. And she was a reporter and columnist for the Copley News uh, Service newspapers. She covered uh, Congress, federal agencies, and departments. Uh, she also served as president of the Washington uh, Press Club, which is now the National Press Club. And she was executive editor of Washington Woman Magazine. Uh, she also uh, has uh, a history of work in government. Uh, she worked for the U.S. Department of State, the National Endowment of Humanities, uh, and the White House, and was actually uh, also a cabinet member for a U.S. state uh, government. So she has both significant and substantial experience in media uh, and in politics, and uh, she uses that experience now uh, to advance the cause of independent journalism um, around the world. The title of her lecture is Press Freedom, Press Freedom and Media Development. She'll speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. At 5 o'clock, we will have a reception right here in this room, which will be uh, a, a chance for all of you to continue to interact uh, with the speaker, uh, also chat about the topic, and uh, to enjoy some Tostitos, which, you know, I say, have been delicious uh, this season. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marguerite Sullivan. Well, you, you all have a book that um, my office sent down, and I just want to say that in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow, yesterday, we are going to be putting this thing out, not in this form, but it's, it's a follow-up of that, um, describing the status of U.S. support of independent media around the world, and I'll send a number of copies up here if, if anyone would be interested. Um, and I'm, but I'm going to give you a lot of the updates today on the statistics that we've gathered. So let me just start off by saying that communications is a, is a very old field, but international media assistance is a new field. It's no more than about 20 years old or so, and it had its, its uh, real growth. Um, after the fall of the, um, the Soviet Union. So it began in the early 1990s, and the U.S. spent, at least in that decade, at least $600 million to try to foster an independent media in the former Soviet Union and in the um, countries such as Hungary, um, the Balkans, et cetera, that were under Soviet uh, dominance. Um, since then, media development has been viewed as a, as a critical component in um, holding governments um, accountable and in, in having the democratic um, societies, in bolstering economic development, um, and in um, helping society uh, give voice to the uh, voiceless, and in um, holding, uh, you know, re really letting women, minorities, et cetera, um, whose voice might not be heard much in many societies, have a voice. So what exactly is media development? It encompasses numerous activities aimed at strengthening the media to be independent, pluralistic, 
um, and professional. It's largely funded by international donors um, and includes such things as training programs, journalism and media management, support to news organizations, and the development of professional organizations such as journalism associations. Um, it also includes impro improving journalism schools. I know you have one of the best journalism schools in the country here. Um, but in many journalism schools internationally, they, they don't teach skills. You never write a story. You never do a broadcast. You never do a radio um, story. It's all studying theory. So many, many students come out of those schools really not having any idea how to write a story. Um, and, and so this um, donor-based assistance in many cases is trying to help the schools. It also, to what you all may be particularly interested in, includes the development of media laws and regulations that are supportive of journalists, such as freedom of information laws, and doing away with harmful laws such as criminal liability. It includes initiative to improve coverage of such key issues as corruption and health care. And I mean, it's, it's um, a very, very important field. But let me start from the beginning. And I want to show you a map. Um, let me try to open this up again. Oops. You might have to hide it since I can't. Okay, I just need to pull this map up. Uh, it is, I forget what you do. But no, we can get rid of more concerned about getting it up on the screen. Oh, it's not up on the screen. Okay. Yeah, uh, so this will be. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, I'm going to show you. And I simply can move it forward. I'm. You should just click on it. It's not similar to. Yeah, it's still flashing off, though, for some unknown reason. Maybe it's one of these? No, no, that's that's set up the way it was. We used it just a moment ago. It was, it was behind you. There's a keypad on the wall. Um, I don't know if you, if you go back to if you just press the bottom one button. I don't know if these things are linked at all. No, this no, will just do the okay. lights. Well, I can walk around and show this map. Okay. <laughs> what you're trying to This is old yeah. school. Yeah. Okay. For those of you can see, this is not, this is 1980, and this is from Freedom House. They're the only group that has done this world worldwide over the these many years. Um, the purple is not free. The yellow is partially free, and the green is free. Okay. Oh, is it up? Go. Okay. Yeah. So now I should turn the light the lights down a little bit. Actually, we got that. That should do it. Can you see? Okay. Yeah, okay, great. now, okay, now to move it forward. This is 1990. As you can, as you can see, let me go back. Oops. Um, is this is 1990, and this is 2000. So as you can see, there's. I mean, look at Russia. It's turned to partially free. So the, I mean, this is one could argue, possibly argue, that this is the effect of a lot of these media development programs where um, $600 million was spent. Most of the bulk of the money was spent in Russia at that time. And this is last year. Um, there, has, there has been a significant rollback in press freedom. So just to go through this again, um, as you'll see, <coughs> so just go through this again. I mean, just look at how the colors change. I'll flash you quickly to today. So 
there has been, um, over the decades, an opening up and then a rolling back. Achievements were made, as I said, and then, uh, like in Russia, there's been a real rollback. In two weeks, the, this is, the new map is going to be released at the museum in Washington, if any of you have um, seen it. It's a great museum. If you haven't, if you're coming to Washington, go and see it. It's an absolutely fabulous museum. I think um, I went this year to, to uh, the discussion of um, one of the regions at um, Freedom House to see how they did this mapping, this uh, rating system, and I think we're going to see in the Middle East some of this go from purple to yellow. Um, even though there's many, so many challenges in a lot of these countries, Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia specifically, I think we're going to see a change, and I think there'll be a lot of news on that. Um, and, and to just give you an example, um, one of the reasons, even though the laws in these countries have not changed to really support media, in Libya, for example, it's gone from one, uh, on, I mean on the whole, one government newspaper, radio, t broadcasting system to today hundreds. And I think it's uh, things like that that, that um, would have red had the, the, uh, the, the color, so to speak, the rating change. Um, before I move on, let me just tell you, there's three major areas that this map um, rates countries on. Uh, there, it's legal, it's political, um, and it is, other one, and it's economic. And since this is, we're in a law school, let me just read you some of the main topics. Um, one is constitution. Do the, does the constitution or other basic laws contain provisions designed to protect freedom of the press and of expression, and are they enforced? Um, are there penalties for libeling officials or the state, and are they enforced? Um, the higher the numbers, the more you get into the purple zone. So you want low numbers. Is the judiciary independent and do courts judge cases concerning the media impartially? Um, is freedom of information legislation in, in place and are journalists able to make use of it? So the, the criteria gets quite specific. Um, one thing that's dramatically changed, as I'm sure you all know, is digital media. And today, we at the center I run, which is, think, is a think tank, we put out papers and do discussions. One of the uh, main topics we're looking at is digital media. And in a, and in a minute, I'm going to mention what a lot of the challenges are. We've had a lot of success stories besides the use of digital media to, to really help people uh, have voice. There's also community radio. There's hundreds of them around, thousands of them around the world. Today, more than 90 countries have freedom of information laws in their books, and investigative journalism centers have spread all around the world. Um, that's some of the good news. For the, for the, the challenges or the bad news, only 15% of the world's population today has an independent media. Um, that's not counting the countries, it's counting the populations uh, in those countries. Murders of journalists have jumped by more than 30% in the last de decade. In, including a big rise in those being put in jail. To, and today, more than half of those jailed are bloggers. Authoritarian regimes are increasingly able to spy on and disrupt those who use digital media. And it's really become a cat and mouse game. Um, the Berkman Center at Harvard says, and I think this figure is really low, is that more than 40 countries now censor the internet, affecting half a billion users. I think that that's a, a low figure, but it's still a very dramatic figure. And on top of that, Western governments are we're cutting our budgets, and I think that could really impact media development. So let me. One of the big things that we look at is media funding, and so what I thought I would do is show you some figures that relate to how much the U.S. and and the rest of the major donors are spending to try to foster an independent media. Now I was asked at lunch, "What do I mean by that?" And yes, it is basically the Western, including. Um, Japan, Australia, probably India, the um, democracies, what their view, this, in, this standard of international media, which is um, not being biased, checking sources, uh, what, we're, what we have had here in this country. Um, I was being challenged at lunch about what I think about the U.S. media, which we can get into in the Q&A, but let me just tell you what the major donors are. The U.S. is, I don't, can you all see this, this figure? 
the total worldwide, this is in 2010 figures, we're estimating that $487 million was spent worldwide on media development. Um, this does not include um, China, the Chinese, which are doing a lot now in, in media development, but it's mainly the, the um, democratic groups. U.S. is the biggest donor at, at $220 million. Um, and we're also the biggest national spender. We have a lot of foundations that give the support um, media, but the U.S., uh, both in the government and in foundations, is the biggest supporter. Uh, this is followed by the European Commission, then the U.K., um, Netherlands, Switzerland, and UNESCO. Um, Sweden and Canada come in. Um, well after that. Um, according to our figures, um, the, uh, the, the, in the U.S., government and private, U.S., the, in, in 2011, I'm sort of jumping between years here, but it's uh, getting the international figures was a, a longer effort than getting the government figures. In 2011, in fiscal year 2011, USAID spent 63 million, the State Department 44 million, and the Open Society Found Foundation, George Soros's foundation, um, spent um, almost uh, 50 million dollars supporting independent media. So, so where does this money go? This shows trends just in U.S. government spending in the two gap categories in which they rank media, and the projects can be really all over the place. One could be um, training journalists uh, to do election reporting, and they can put it into the media freedom category. And another uh, person who's filling, having to fill out these spending boxes could put it in the freedom of information category. So these, these uh, the, it's very hard to get the data. But what it shows is, um, that the, if you, this is between 2007, this color here, this first one here, through 2000, fiscal year 2011. And what it, 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 it shows is you'll notice there's big spikes in the Near East and South and Central Asia. And that came from media development support in Iraq and Afghanistan. So the money sort of chases where the governmental interest is. Um, and to just show you another data point, um, this is a split between USAID and the State Department. USAID is, does more, um, a, it used to do bricks and mortar, and it sort of does that in media. Um, it used to build bridges, that's trying to, to build systems, better systems up. Um, the State Department is particularly interested in, 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 um, in human rights, um, and it comes out comes particularly from their Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, the funding. But as you will see, um, this is the State Department, and they're doing a lot of projects out of the State Department rather than um, decentralized in the countries. I don't want to get too technical here, but we'll just, this will just give you an overall picture. And lastly, where does the money go? Um, this was. This is a very unsystematic. What we did to come up with this, with this figure uh, is, as you will note in this book, we did the, the same thing four years ago. Nobody can tell you where the money went. The, the um, USAID can't specifically tell you where the money went. So where, what we did is we went to the major implementers to, um, to come up with a figure of exactly what was spent on, on what sort of thing. And we found that nearly 30% was spent on training, training journalists, probably training judges on what, how to use freedom of information, for example, but anything that was training. Direct assistance took about 28%. Um, and those were things like putting up radio towers, building and distributing radios in a box. Um, and then all of these others were much less the legal environment, trying to you know pass freedom of information laws, do away with criminal defamation, was only about 5.4 percent of the overall figures, and this is you know to me very disturbing because I think the um, legal environment is you're never going to get an independent media unless you have laws that protect journalists and you do away with the laws that are harmful. 
Um, and even though U.S. funding overall jumped by more than 50 percent from 2006 to 2010, the dollars still are still very tiny. The, the overall amount of U.S. foreign assistance devoted to media development is just 0.4 percent. So it's less than 1 percent. I mean, it's absolutely nothing. I have one more slide to show you. This, is, this compares activity from 2008, when we put up this um, book that you all have, using 2006 data and 2010 data that we had here where the money went. Training went down from 44 percent to, to around 30 percent, because many people are now, many of those involved in this field are now seeing that you can't simply train a journalist, as they initially were thinking uh, when the Cold War ended. Train a journalist to have you know, good um, standards of um, the international standards of journalism, and you will get the readers, the public will come, the money will come to sustain it. And that has not happened. Governments have clamped down, the laws are not in place. So people are now seeing you need the other elements but the overall percentage, for example, for the legal environment, the dollars have stayed the same, but the percentages of overall funding have dropped from 9% to just 5%. So, the, I mean, the law, in my opinion, is not getting enough attention. One thing that has increased, I mean, you probably can't see this because this type is probably rather small but in the back of the room, is media literacy wasn't even on this other, was very small, it was less than 1%, it was 0.2% before. Today it's around 4%. Those are programs um, such as one that, that I think is a very good program that's in the Crimea in the Ukraine where they're training, um, where every Sunday um, Internews has worked with um, local activists. Internews is a, a, a large media development um, implementer, has worked with activists there in, in the Crimea to have a television show every Sunday that takes the, you know, the, the hottest news story of the week, brings in the journalists, brings some people affected by the story or interviewed by the story or just interested in the story to have a dialogue about should other people have been interviewed, you know, what is the outcome of the story, what's the impact, so that you build an awareness in the public of how to judge good and bad um, media. Um, so, so that is the end of my slice, but I will put back up. Right. Let's see. Anyway, I'll just I'll take these down. Okay. Now, so I'm going to just cover some quickly some of the key issues in this field that we see as big problems and what some of the solutions are. We need to increase the funding and increase the funding base. Um, New media um, have certainly gotten into this field. Omidyar, which is the eBay uh, Foundation, is now supporting um, independent media um, in, cer in, in certain of its projects. Um, so is Gates. Um, Google um, are, are also big players. Um, but they're still very small compared to the, the U.S. government and the Soros Foundation. Um, there's, but there's many other challenges besides funding. One is digital media. 90% um, of the world has some access to cell phones and 30% have access to the internet. But uh, just as people are having voice and they're be able to get out their opinion, governments are tracking them. Um, they are um, playing a cat and mouse game. Circumvention tools are being developed and um, as soon as one is developed, the authoritarian governments get wise to it and crack down on those um, uh, activists, really, that are getting, you know, are using the tools a lot. Um, they shut down websites, um, and online journalists are targeted more than ever. In fact, they're targeted far more than traditional journalists because they don't have the institutional or organizational groups behind them to protect them. What needs to be done? We need much more protection of digital activists and journalists. Um, we, it, many don't even know the basic safety tips. For instance, they don't know anything about using Tor, which routes web traffic in ways that disguise um, sites that people have visited. 
Uh, we need more development of circumvention tools um, that are nearly impossible for governments to block. Yes, it, as I said, it is a cat and mouse game, but um, the U.S. is expending a lot of money trying to help activists in Iran, um, uh, Cuba, and, and, and uh, many other places. Um, Today, the basics, uh, we have certainly a lot of access to um, information, but we, don't, we haven't really done um, much to train people on how to verify information, how to balance sor sources, how to produce a news story. So we need much more training in media literacy. Um, another issue is sustainability. In much of the world, independent media organizations are more constrained by economic and market conditions than they are by censorship but little money is spent on, on helping them become competent businesses. They have poor business practices, um, they have donor dependence, and very poorly paid reporters who may have to turn to taking bribes just to feed their families. Understanding the business side of journalism is crucial to sustaining independent media. Donors often don't have clear exit strategies, so the minute their money is pulled out, the local media organizations collapse. So we need much more attention paid to this field in advertising, marketing, audience research. Another issue is certainly, as I mentioned earlier, the legal environment. Onerous laws and regulations can stunt the growth of media, and the legal tools to do this are numerous. They include defamation, privacy, insult laws, high monetary judgments and lawsuits, sweeping national security statutes, and licensing and broadcast spectrum restrictions. Libel laws are a main tool used to clamp down on critical media. And although libel is treated in many democracies as a civil offense, in too many parts of the world, it remains a criminal offense. There's also, as I said, a rising trend of imprisoned journalists from 81 in 2000 to 179 in 2011. Um, half our national security cases. So what needs to be done in this field? Libel and insult laws need to be decriminalized. Broadcasting regulations should be transparent and fair. Um, and we need to have much greater support of freedom of information laws. Often um, activists feel that they're successful by getting the laws on the books, but they don't carry it through to the next stage of, of um, following up that they're implemented and educating <coughs> the public. Especially um, crucial is working to protect internet access and freedom of expression online, both nationally and internationally. Russia, China, and Uzbekistan, and I think Tajikistan have um, been pushing um, a international standard at the UN to try to really limit um, internet access. It, their, their first attempt failed, but uh, from all accounts, they're going to keep trying. Safety is another issue. Um, killings of journalists are just the tip of the iceberg. Beatings, kidnappings, imprisonments, and threats against journalists are far more numerous and can be very effective in silencing them. Few donors support the kind of broad-based training that is most needed, safety training. And particularly, there's very little safety training on the, lo on the local level. Many of the journalists, and there's a record number that have been killed in Mexico, have been on the local level, not the national, not, not national reporters. Um, additionally, um, donors today um, are really not giving enough support to organizations that track killings and physical attacks and jailing of journalists. And the data is really all over the place. Um, the Committee to Protect Journalists has one number. Reporters Without Borders has another number. There's many groups that count the number of journalists that have been killed or harassed, and the numbers vary widely. We also need much more research about media development. To date, much of it has been quantitative. How many people have been trained? How many journalists were in a room being trained? And very little has been qualitative. What difference did it make? We just brought together a group of um, ap academics, implementers, and, and some donors um, as part of a two-day um, session 
at the request of USAID to see if we could come up with some, a common agreement on what would be content improvement. How do you judge whether content has improved in a lot of these, pro in, in many of these projects over time? And actually, we should get you guys involved if you're interested. Um, we're going to have the second meeting to try to come up with some, some uh, guidelines in, in a couple of months. Um, what difference a project's made is very, very hard to get. And we really need a central clearinghouse where people can give information without being fearful that it will be used against them or that uh, critical data will be stolen by, by one of their competitors. We need really good assessments on what has worked, what hasn't worked, why, and how it could be done better. USAID has started to put its formal evaluations of its projects online. One pro private donor is doing this, the Knight Foundation. But only one implementer, Search for Common Ground, is doing so. No one wants to talk about what projects failed or didn't do as well as they had expected. But maybe those pushing for more transparency internationally need more transparency themselves. We also need to take the long view. Too often, media development support falls into the flavor of the month trap, which I showed you in some of those in those some of those donor charts, um, with donors and implementers rushing to whatever region is in the news. In the 1990s, it was a former Soviet Union and Soviet bloc countries. Then it was Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and now it is the Middle East and North Africa. But what happens is that donors pull out of the countries where they're really. In, in, getting some work done to rush to another one before, to another region before the work is done. And the results are the press freedoms are rolled back. Developing and sustaining independent media takes a very long time. It's a long-term effort and, a, and it needs a global approach over many, many years. And lastly, we don't have enough coordination. Duplication wastes money. Projects need to be coordinated at all levels, at the donor level, in pooled resources, or at least having the donors discuss who is funding what. Our government agencies, such as USAID, have a very hard time, in fact, I think they're blocked from putting money into a pool because from congressional regulations, they have to account for every dollar, where did it go, how was it spent, they have to make those decisions. So that's hard for them, but they can at least discuss, and they are at the local level, who is, what they're funding with other donors. This, the Nordics, for example, put a lot of money in the development. Um, if, and let me just mention an example on this. In, in 2005, um, the GAO, the General Ac uh, Accounting Office, did a study that found that after the 2000 earthquake and tsunami in Aceh in Indonesia, that one government agency gave funding to an NGO to put up a radio tower in Aceh, and then another U.S. government agency did exactly the same thing with another NGO. So they both were constructing radio towers that were supposed to do the same work. Today, government agencies are talking to each other a lot more, and they often come to us asking us to coordinate activities with outside donors, because we are a neutral platform. We're not seeking funding from them. Uh, we're funding, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, where we sit. And there is more strategy, and there is more information sh sharing, but there needs to be a lot more. So to sum up, what, what needs to be done in this field is that we need to look holistically, not piecemeal in a journalism training there without thinking of how, um, it, it, what the legal environment is like. I mean, we need to do all of this at once, I think. We need to sim not just do one project, one off project, without thinking of what the general landscape is. And this brings me to my last point. We need you. There are so few experts in this field. At USAID, which is handing out, as I showed you, millions and millions of dollars, there are only five media experts, only five people that really know, that spend their day, all day, working on media development issues. So I hope that you will think about giving this important field a try. And for those of you that are studying law, there, is, there are no lawyers there looking at this issue. We need, this really, this field really needs experts. Most of them are in private law firms and they do pro bono work trying to help in this field, but we really need um, people trained in the law that can do media development work. So I really think that you can make a difference. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions or comments.
Okay, plenty of time for questions. Yes. Do you see um, more political projects like um, Radio Free Europe or Alpera or some of those things as part of the problem or part of the solution? Do you see that as part of what you do? No, that's that falls in the public um, diplomacy pot, so to speak. And no, that is not what we do. But that, I mean, but you're raising a very interesting topic because there are a number of people in the in media development who feel that those millions and millions of dollars spent on um, Radio Free Europe, um, VOA, etc., should be used only for media development, and that if you raise the media in a country. If, if you raise the capacity of media and all these different um, levels, business sustainability, professionalization, the legal environment, that you will good, get the same outcome. I would differ with that, and I think you really need both. Because in many countries, such as a Burma, which has um, until recently not opened up, and who knows how far it will, will go in this tiny opening of the door, um, if, if VOA has been st sending in um, uh, their broadcasts, and if they can't get them in, they're, and the National Endowment for Democracy on the program side, which I'm not on, um, it gives out $100 million a year in grants. And they have been funding uh, a number of Burmese activists to, to carry news in. Sometimes it, it's on CDs or thumb drives, so that, and, sometimes, and it's often passed around, so people are getting news. But that is not media development. That's really, that's public diplomacy in many ways. So I think you need a, you know, it's a balance. It really depends upon what, um, what the situation is. Yeah. Isn't media development in many ways public diplomacy through a different route? How? I don't think so. Well, public diplomacy for the U.S. and for the British that that, that are doing it too is. It's passing. It's putting out information that you want people to know about your country in the best light you can put it in. However, VOA um, and Radio Free Europe um, were putting out information, have been putting out information, both that's uh, a balanced VOA. You know, it's supposed to be and Radio Free Europe information about their own your, their own countries that they weren't getting. The, Which is different than building the media in a country. I understand that, but the, the funding for building the media and the classes that are being run, I could be completely wrong in this, but I'm guessing most of the people that are enjoying those resources understand where it's coming from and why they're getting those resources. Which is, in a way, diplomacy. Yes, but many of the people doing the tr the training, for example, are locals, mm -hmm. um, or they are, um, for example, in um, I, I know in Iraq um, there were a lot of of um, Bulgarians, Romanians, ex Slovakians going to Iraq for a under U.S. funding to do training of journalists. So it's a in this, these figures I showed you had were not public diplomacy figures. That's a, those are totally separate funding, much bigger funding. So it's different. We're back here and then to you. Yes. Um, regarding the slides that show the free press and the harsh media, with all due respect, isn't that akin to being slightly pregnant? I mean, one can only be pregnant or not pregnant. Um, that's a good question, and it's I have it here. It's online under Freedom House if you want to look at it. Um, it is based on a numerical scale. So if you um, you're considered to be free if you're between zero and thirty, you're you're considered to be partially free if you're between thirty-one and sixty, and not free if you're between sixty-one and hundred. There are um, a lot of countries that fall really close to the line on either of those. So um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, so Pakistan, for example, has an explosion of media, um, and but it 
It has a lot of um, harassment of journalists, killing of journalists. So I believe if I have to I should go back and look, I think it is in the partially free. I might be wrong. There it could be in the not free. I mean, it, in, in a lot of these cases, it's mushy. You know, sometimes it depends a lot upon whether you can start a newspaper, you can start, you can do a broadcasting. I mean, if you have the liberty, the freedom to, to start a, a media organization or media effort, it could be one a blogger. Um, is this is this perfect? What they do, absolutely not. But it highlights <laughs> the issue. But it's a perfect, absolutely not. And they'll admit that themselves. It's a very inexact science. Yeah. Is there a country that pursues those ideals of an open press better than the United States? And if so, should we be promoting <coughs> that image? So, so in a way, are we not as attractive? That is a very interesting question. And um, in fact, all your questions are very good. Uh, Reporters Without Borders also comes out with, I mean, a number of groups do these rankings. Reporters Without Borders has not been doing this as long as Freedom House. They ranked the U.S. this year, I think theirs came out in January, February, level with the same number, I don't remember what it is, is Hungary. Now, Hungary recently has been going through a big rollback in its press freedom. Um, and it did the, it, it um, did this, if, if I recall, um, because of the whole uh, WikiLeaks uh, Fallout. Um, they, they did it for you know a number of reasons, but I mean I personally don't think that Hungary and the U.S. have the same. Um, I think we have much more press freedom than, than Hungary does. The U.S. is not at the top of any of these of any of these lists. Freedom House. Um, well, I mean, I think I do, they do rank the U.S., but I, they certainly don't go into a lot of written detail about the U.S. But um, I mean, reports without borders, the, the U.S. I think is down is ranked 40. I don't remember what the number is, but it's certainly not number one. The Nordics, if I recall, are on the top of the list. Yeah. Um, do you think the developing world is more As far as what? Hindering the spread of independent media. Because to compare the timeline Radio for Europe was started and now it seems like there's so many more obstacles mm -hmm. than there were. No, I think digital media is, is fabulous. And I think um, I, it has many challenges. And one is it's, it's how it's been used by authoritarian governments. Um, but it, 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 if we can solve, and, I'm, and we're moving to mobile, I mean mobile is where it's all going to be. If, we can, if, the, if the issue can be solved, and I, I do not know the technology, but if the issue, if the issue of circumvention, um, and there's a lot of, uh, today there's a story in the New York Times, I don't know if any of you read it, about um, this, this man that started, has started a new um, technology that can go around the sensors, and I think most of it's on mobile. I mean, the more that we can have, um, give voice to the to everyone, I th you know, we are a achieving a lot of what we want. However, the issue is, how do you judge what's true from what's false? How do you, um, how, I mean, we've done away with the gatekeepers that you used to have when I was a journalist. You had an editor. That if, the editor basically decided what was news and not news, sent the reporters out, the reporters wrote the story, the people consumed it on television, radio, or newspapers, or magazines. That's done away with now. Um, and today we have a flood of information and we need, to be, we need to be able to judge much, in a much better way, what is, we need to become journalists, really, and, and, and see what can we judge as credible, what is, is not credible. And eventually, we were talking about this at lunch, it's like crowdsourcing, and eventually you will be, there will be trusted sources of news um, that one would go to and would learn about. But at the moment, in the U.S. anyway, as a former journalist, I, um, it's, it's a total crisis. No one really knows where we're headed, what the model will be. Um, but I think it will come out well in the end. I mean, I'm very optimistic. Maybe I'm being naive. But of course, I mean, you want um, in, in 
Burma, for example, you don't want um, foreign, ultimately you want the Burmese to be able to produce uh, credible and, and news that they can, uh, that they're putting out themselves rather than foreign sources sending in the news. I mean, that's, you know, the goal, I think. Yeah. I just want to preface by saying I'm absolutely not in favor of state-run media. You're not in... in not in favor of, of state-run media. I don't... Mm -hmm. I agree with you guys, too. But if you were to go to China and talk to a, a citizen of China that's been there and all he's known or she has known is state-run media, I'm just kind of curious how you would respond to that by saying, well, state-run media is bad, but that's all he's known he or she tends to think that that's what I've known. That's that's okay. Um, I think public broadcasting it can be very good, but government media, um, I don't. I think we should um, not call it good because the media should be a watchdog on the government. I mean, that's what it, that's what one of its roles is, and you can't do that if the source that's putting out the information is the same source that's allegedly checking on you. So, uh, the BBC is a good model on the, on the whole. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about uh, donors. You had a big list of donors, some of them are different government agencies, mm -hmm. some of them are back to it, yeah. private, so you have Knights, uh, Open Society Institute. Mm -hmm. um, do they, what are, are there any tensions in the priorities of these different donors? I mean, presumably they have different perspectives about uh, what kind of media they think is important, what kind of independence they think is important. So I wonder if you could describe that, um, and I have a follow-up question. Yes, yes. So I, we, we work a lot with the donors, and I can, I can tell you that um, they all, digital, it's digital, digital, digital. It's, it, for example, the Knight Foundation uh, has supported, for a very long time, a lot of training centers for journalists. They're not doing that anymore. Their priority now is digital. It's completely it's digital, digital, digital. You know, at the new donors are in the private sector are digital. The the U.S. government m most of the projects do encompass digital in some ca capacity. But that's a that's a so, so a, they all yeah. yes they absolutely all have their different priorities. Okay. Um, Omidyar, the, the eBay that came out of the eBay funds money. Um, theirs is on governance and transparency. It's transparency really. Um, Gates is health education, uh, but but as um, Gates has has learned, I mean they will never say directly that they do media development, but they do do media development, and they come to meetings that we have of donors and and um, and, and uh, there was a big media for it, it, the implementers too. There's a big meeting in Africa uh, last year for an initiative, African Media Initiative, and they were at that. They come to a lot of, of meetings. Um, they. I mean, the example that's been typically used on how they got into media development is that they wanted to put a, a mosquito nets um, in in certain countries in Africa uh, to prevent uh, malaria. Um, they found that people were afraid to put up the nets because they were they thought they you know for whatever superstitious reason. So then they would pay for advertising in newspapers and on particularly on community radio. But the minute the, um, the program stopped, there were no more stories about the nets. So what they learned is you really have to affect the overall media environment to get good health reporting, for example, to educate people on why they needed to put up the mosquito nets. So m many of them will never say that they do media development. Um, Howard Buffett, the son of Warren Buffett, um, has a foundation that only funds uh, agricultural projects. So he's doing agricultural um, training of would-be or, or, or people that call themselves agricultural reporters in, in um, Africa. But he would never call, say that he does media development. So they all come at, come at it at a different angle. So U.S. government typically is doing it to promote democracy. The Europeans are typically funding media development to alleviate poverty. But I think ultimately the goals are the same. Do they des They do come together and talk. And so the related question was a donor that wasn't part of your figures, which is China. So you said China's yes. doing a lot of training. So yes. presumably they're not, I mean, they have some goal in mind in their media and development. What is that would goal? Fall in, in my, in my yeah. definition, to answer the, the, 
the earlier question, to, to me that would fall under Chinese public diplomacy. They are trying to get out their message to better China. Now they are doing a lot of things, and there was another, it was also an interesting piece, I think it was yesterday, the day before, in the, in the New York Times about what China was doing in an op-ed. There, and we did a report on this about two years ago on what China was doing in Latin America and in Africa. They are, they're building journalism schools, they're putting up entire broadcasting systems in the local language, also in English. Um, they're doing that here in the United States, they're starting a, 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 um, a news channel. They are taking journalists um, to China to train them in their um, view of what media should be. Um, so yes, I mean, there's a lot of activity in this area. And how does their view of journalism say differ from? Their journalism, I mean, one, one of the um, codes of ethics of the society, uh, SPJ, the, the Society of Professional Journalists, which is, is viewed as the standard code of journalism ethics for, for American journalists is do no harm. And I would say that ex the Chinese would take only that and um, use that, do no harm to the state, do no harm to the officials, do no harm uh, to, to security. I mean, there's, there's is maintaining public order. Um, Chavez, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's the one that said this, has said that, that in Venezuela, the elected official should be telling people what is news. So the, his view is the government says what you should know. That's why he's been taking over a lot of government, uh, of, um, independent media. There's, he's at war with them. I mean, it's so. so I mean, that is, in my opinion, and in many people's opinion, what the Chinese is try, are trying to do. We still have time for a couple more questions. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you are communication students? And how many want to become journalists or how many want to go into uh, public affairs or, or, or PR? Who want, wait, you want to go to PR? Well, I already have my undergrad in PR and journalism. Mm -hmm. um, actually, a few of us are planning on going to Liberia to train media, uh, uh -huh. to train journalists. For whom? Um, for a project called Together Liberia. You're working with New Narratives. You're working with what? With New Narratives, another organization that also uh, does one-on-one -on -one journalism training in Liberia. Um, and I think they're also branching into Sierra Leone this year. And uh, they're an NGO? Based here at Syracuse or based where? Based there. Based there. Um, and we're also um, working on working with the Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs, and Tourism. But that's productive. Mm -hmm. That's great. And are you going to be doing radio? Are you doing broadcasts? Are you doing print? Um, what are you doing? Because radio is really big there. Yeah, mostly print. Um, the Together Liberia Journalism Project focuses on print journalism, um, basic journalism technique, how to investigate fairly, how to use a camera, how to record an interview, um, basic technology stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Last summer, they went to Liberia and set up a cage, um, essentially with a whole bunch of donated um, technology um, for people to check out, um, go record a story, and then they can turn mm -hmm. back to the camera after they mm -hmm. finish producing it. So. That's, that's terrific. I mean, one of um, there, the National Endowment for Democracy has a lot of fellows that come for six months or, or five months. And one of them was from Liberia a, a couple of years ago, and he said something very interesting, because a lot of these media projects are top-heavy. They come in, they parachute in, they expect to change something very quickly on the ground, they parachute out, or they bring in all this equipment that, that's really the, that can't be used. And he's a, he was a radio journalist and, and runs a journalism center, and he said, somebody asked him what he needed, and he said, wire. He said, um, a, a particular NGO that I won't name had come in, set up, brought in extremely expensive equipment. This is funded by USAID. Um, it broke, nobody could fix it. And he said, I could have put the radio uh, in, together had I had wire, had they just given me wire. So when you go, you know, look to see if you see excesses like that. Because truly, you know, what we've seen is the donor money will rush in huge sums of money and it, it can't be absorbed. Um, so we really, you know, we really need to be working on building capacities from the ground up, not pouring it in from the 
top down. And how many are lawyers? Seven to be laws. And, and do any of you want to go into me, do media law? And what, what kind of, um, what do you want to do? Do you want to work for a law firm or do you want to work for an NGO? Or? Mm -hmm. what, what about you? I kind of put like this because I'm a little undecided. I have a background in um, media, so that's one of the areas that I'm interested in. But I kind of feel like the market will decide for me what I end up doing. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and speaking of the market and, and local uh, uh, media, can you comment on like the, the fairness doctrine, how we've had so much uh, uh, liberty and freedom, uh, presumably in our local uh, United States media, that some people feel like they were excluded or there was a super saturation of one particular uh, viewpoint and not uh, an adequate representation of another viewpoint, um, taking that independent or free media to its, to its end, uh, saying, well, some people now feel underrepresented uh, even though it's free and open. Uh, to, to give you an example of um, something that is ridiculous, there was um, a, a California newspaper that was very, very Republican. This was a long time ago. And it um, was heavily criticized for being, this is when Nixon was running for president, for, for not for supporting him too much. So what it did is it measured, it would measure the stories with a ruler to see that there was an equal representation, but the words within the text were heavily slanted towards Nixon. Um, I mean, I think the fairness document, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, uh, the fairness, I, co I covered politics, but I didn't cover, I'm not a lawyer. I think the fairness document uh, 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 rule is needed. I mean, we need to have we have so much um, freedom here, the journalists do, that you, we need to have certain principles that, that we follow. Um, I was asked, that, I think you were there at lunch, whether, were you there at lunch? No, okay. Um, I'm getting you mixed up. <laughs> uh, what did I think about the, what was happening in the U.S. media? And I think the U.S. media has really gone, has deteriorated in many ways, because we, if you have a particular political Persuasion. You can watch Fox, or you can watch MSNBC, and and you will only get. You really have to watch both to find out what really happened. Um, so would you would you say they're following the fairness doctrine? No, I, I think I think that the, and my response, I guess, if that's your question, is that, is that freedom you. freedom has kind of driven the to the extreme e economics and, and freedom has driven driven the market. Uh, and, and allowed one to kind of fizzle out, and that's why I think uh, uh, Air America died, mm -hmm. um, and, and as a result, and other other media sources. I, I I would say um, another way to describe it is the media, besides being a watchdog, is supposed to it serves a public service role, and it's not only um, in place to. Uh, Make sure that they meet the you know they meet the bottom line. It's only not only shouldn't be in place for commercial reasons. And I think in, perhaps commerce has taken over too much. And as advertising base it has fallen and moved online, where the revenue is not as high, we are in a crisis. I want to just end with reading you this quote that um, from a speech that President Obama gave in 2009 um, at a memorial at a service for Walter Cronkite. He said. Despite the big news of our area, serious, serious journalists find themselves all too often without a beat. Just as the news cycle has shrunk, so has the bottom line. We find that void with instant commentary and celebrity gossip. And the softer stories that Walter dis disdained, rather than the hard news and investigative journalism he championed. What happened today is replaced with who won today. The public debate cheapens, the public trust falters. We fail to understand our world, our rural, our world, or one another as well as we should, and that has real consequences in our own lives and in the life of our nation. We seem stuck 
with a choice between what cuts to our bottom line and what harms us as a society, which price is higher to pay, which cost is harder to bear. So I think, you know, you could, you haven't asked me with the crisis going on in the United States, how can we be pushing our views internationally? I mean, that's a question you haven't before. asked me. Well, I did, actually, we talked about that earlier before. <laughs> and I think that's a valid, you know, valid question. But, you know, for those of us that are in toiling in this very niche field, um, you know, we adhere to the earlier values of, you know, fairness, balance, um, checking sources, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, hopefully we will prevail. But it ta as I said at lunch to people at lunch, it really takes you all to demand better media to, to get it. We are out of time. Thank okay, you thank so much. Thank you.